So we've been going through this series of the Minor Prophets, and congratulations, everyone. You've made it to the last week of the Minor Prophets. So this morning we're going to be looking at the book of Micah. And actually the passage that we're looking at today is kind of a summary of a lot of the things that we've been talking about already. So this morning, if you've been with us this whole time, you'll hear some familiar reminders, hopefully, and hopefully some new things as well. Um, So if you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Micah 6, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. Micah 6, 1 through 8. It says, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. He says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And then Micah responds, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words from your prophet Micah, and we ask that you teach us this morning from them, and teach us more about you and who you are, and who we are as your people. And let us leave this place transformed this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So I learned a couple interesting facts about Micah this week. First of all, Micah's name means who is like Yahweh, who is like God. And this is interesting. If you read through the whole book, there's this kind of sense of awe throughout the whole book of prophecy about who God is and how, how powerful and holy he is. Just like all the other minor prophets that we've looked at, he's got some doom and gloom in his prophecy. God is angry and is going to punish God's people, but there's this sense of awe about it, not just fear and trembling, but awe at God's holiness. So that kind of permeates the book of Micah. And then secondly, I learned this week that Micah was a farmer and lived out in the country, and so he was prophesying to people in the country and to wealthy landowners. A lot of the other prophets we've looked at were in cities and talking to leaders, but Micah was a country boy talking to other country boys. And essentially, he was prophesying to his boss, if you can imagine doing that. He was, he was fighting for justice for all the poor farmers that were being kind of oppressed by these wealthy, greedy landowners. And so throughout Micah, there's this whole kind of urgency for justice. And you can hear it a little bit in our passage this morning. He wants things to be fair and just as God is fair and just. So those are the two kind of major, major plot points, I guess, going through the the gospel or the prophecy of Micah. So that brings us to chapter six, which we'll dig into a little bit this morning. And it begins with God bringing a lawsuit against Israel. You can kind of imagine this divine courtroom and here's God giving his testimony. And I love the way that God starts his sort of testimony here. He says, what have I done to you? And he's not asking it as a legitimate question, really. It's kind of a, kind of a metaphorical thing, because God hasn't done anything to Israel. He's just done a whole lot of things for Israel. He, he's not a God of burden. He's a God of redemption. And so he's, he's not asking with, with a respecting or looking for a response. He's asking, trying to get Israel to see all the things he's done for them. And so God gives this litany of ways in which he's rescued his people. He talks about how he rescued them from slavery in Egypt and how he sent leaders to guide them and how he saved them from plots from enemies and from all this hardship and difficulty. So like I said, God hasn't done anything to Israel. He's just done things for them because God has made a promise or a covenant with Israel that he would always be their God, 
and they would always be his people. He makes that same promise to us to never leave us or forsake us. And here God is giving proof, giving his testimony that he hasn't forgotten that promise. He looks back throughout all of Israel's history and recalls these moments where he saved them and rescued them and redeemed them. But you see, God doesn't just lay this list out just to, to get praise or to give accolades or a pat on the back. He's not just trying to give a list. He wants to do it to change how Israel lives in the future. He wants to give Israel a reason to trust him, to have hope for the future, and to live differently as they go forward to what God will do next. You see, when we look back and remember what God did for us in the past too, it gives us these reasons to trust him. We don't look back just to reminisce or to give thanks for how far we've come or where we are now, although those are good things to do, but we look back so that we can remember that God was faithful before and know that he'll be faithful again. A couple of weeks ago, John was preaching on one of the other minor prophets, and he left us with this challenge to, to take up that question in 1 Peter 3, where it says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. So I've never been one to not do my homework, so I took that challenge and I started writing an actual physical list of all the reasons that I have hope. And I was going through that list over the last couple of weeks and I realized that all of my reasons were things that God had done for me in the past. None of my reasons would, would win a logical argument or they, weren't, they wouldn't make a really good persuasive essay because they were all things that I experienced of God's faithfulness. So I looked back and saw how God had been faithful, and then I could say to God, this is why I know that you'll be faithful again. This is why I can trust you for my present and my future, and follow you as I continue with you. And that's what God is doing in this passage here in Micah. He shows Israel all the ways that he's been faithful in the past, so that they can have hope and trust and continue walking with him into whatever future he has for them. God does this all over the Old Testament. If you read through books like Leviticus and Numbers, first of all, you're very brave for reading Leviticus and Numbers, but also <laughs> you'll notice that when God gives rules and laws and regulations to Israel, kind of after each section, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. It's as if God is saying, you can trust me and you can obey these things because I did this thing for you before. Or throughout the minor prophets that we've been looking at, whenever God promises restoration or renewal, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. He's saying, you can believe and trust in me that I will do these things for you because I've done them before. I always hold up my end of the bargain. God calls his people to remember so they can have hope and so they can live into God's future. Here at Harvard Church, we have an incredibly beautiful history to remember. A short one, maybe, but a good one. <laughs> it's incredible to think back to the last three or four years or so that we've been a church and see how far God has brought us. To think that maybe three or four years ago, Harvard Church was just eight people in the Caldwell's living room. And then a little while after that, it was just 20 people in a pizza place. And now here we are in this building, maybe 70 people or so on a Sunday. And it was, it's incredible just to see how far we've come. It's amazing to look back at how, how the vision of Harvard Church, the reason we're named Harvard Church was because it was supposed to be right by the Edmonds Ferry Harbor. <laughs> but God, God clearly had other plans and he moved us to this little landlocked neighborhood in the middle of Seattle. So no one knows why we're called Harvard Church anymore, but <laughs> you can see the changes that God has done. It's incredible to think of this last year and think about how we had maybe half of our worship team a year ago, and we barely had a garden functioning a year ago, and we didn't have a preschool, we didn't have Libby, we didn't have all kinds of things that our church has now. Many of you weren't here a year ago. It's amazing to see how far God has brought us. And in the meantime, we can all look at our individual lives and see the hurts and the celebrations and how far God's brought us each as individuals too. And it's good to look back and remember these things and give thanks for where we were and where we are now. But if we stop there, we're missing it. We're missing the whole point. We have to keep in mind 
that God helps us recall the past so that we can have hope and trust in him as we move forward in the future. We can look back in amazement at how far God has brought us, but there's one more step we have to take or we miss the whole thing. We have to turn that amazement into trust so we can take that next step with God and see what God will do next. I think that Micah understood that a little bit in our passage this morning. Because after God gives his whole list of all these things that he's done for Israel, Micah asks, with what shall I come before the Lord? In other words, Micah wants to respond to what God has done. God, Micah knows that God has been faithful, and he wants to give the right response. So he asks, "How? what do I do? How do I respond to all of this? But the problem is Micah gets the question wrong at first. He asks, what can I give? What can I respond with? As if there was this perfect thing he could give or the perfect thing he could do to, to even out the scales between him and God. Last week, Jeremy talked about transactional relationships and transactional religion and challenged us that so often we reduce our relationships to transactions where we want to even the scales or make sure that I'm getting the best end of the deal or, or try and do something for you to keep me in your good graces. And Jeremy said that we often do this with God too. We, we know that God's been faithful in the past so we want to do the right things and say the right prayers so that our prayers continue to be answered and so we stay on his good side. But that's not what God calls us to. But this is the kind of thing Mike is looking for here. What thing can I give to respond the right way to God's faithfulness? And in our passage this morning, you maybe notice there's kind of an, an escalating list of options that Micah comes up with that maybe that would be the right thing. You can kind of hear Micah bargaining with God a little bit, saying, okay, so you've been faithful, so maybe I'll give you a burnt offering of a calf a year old. Would that be okay? Oh, too small. So how about thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of olive oil? And still too small. What about, what about my firstborn child? Would that be big enough, finally, <laughs> to, to even it out? And thankfully, none of these things are the right answers. Jeremy reminded us last week that God doesn't call us into this kind of transactional religion. It's not true for our relationship with each other or our relationship with God. God doesn't simply want our rituals or our things that we can give him to placate him. But there's a sense in which we can't totally blame Micah for his questions. If you know the Old Testament, you know that there was this whole system of sacrifices and ways to respond to God. And the things that Micah thinks of as possibilities for his sacrifices are all acceptable things. There are, there are rules that say you can sacrifice a calf a year old. Or there are stories of King David sacrificing thousands of rams or what was described as rivers of oil. And thankfully, in, in the Old Testament, human sacrifice was never really a thing, but in other religions it was. So all of these options that Micah comes up with were, were valid suggestions, valid questions to ask in his mind. He wanted to be sure he got the right sacrifice. He was told that they should sacrifice, so he just wanted to do it right. But that was the problem. That was exactly the problem. God didn't want these rote rituals anymore. He didn't want meaningless worship. He didn't want these things because Israel's heart wasn't in it. He wanted their hearts. The only reason these sacrifices would have been offered is because Micah thought that's what he was supposed to do. Or that's the way it's always been done. He wanted, Micah wanted more faithfulness from God and he thought that if he found that right sacrifice, he could secure it because he gave that right ram or that right river of oil. And how often don't we think the same way? How often don't we come to worship just because it's what we've always done on a Sunday? Or how often do we come and sing the songs and take communion and do all the right things, but our heart's just not in it anymore? How often do we give up our time or our talents or our resources just because it's what we're supposed to do, not because it's something we love to do or we're excited about or even really believe in. You see, the last few verses of our passage this morning, 
show that God wants so much more for us than that. He wants so much more than our rituals or our, our rote going through the motions of faith. The question Micah should have asked and that we should ask wasn't, what can I give, but how can I not give back for what you said, for what you did for me? How, could, how can I hold anything back from you? God doesn't want a thing from us. He wants everything. He wants every part of who we are. Let me read again this famous verse at the end of our passage. Here in Micah, it says that God doesn't want these sacrifices. Instead, he's shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you, of us? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with him. God doesn't want us to search for things to make him happy or minimum requirements or the right boxes to check to keep us in his good graces. God wants us to hand over everything our whole lives to him. He wants us to act with justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. This verse is a really famous and well-loved one, and I think because I knew it for so long and so well, it seemed like such an easy thing. I was, as I was preparing the sermon, I was kind of ready at first to come up and say, we've complicated things too much. We've made it so difficult with all of our rules and rituals and things we have to do, but really, all God wants is this. But the more I looked at this packet passage and kind of lived with it this week, the more I realized this is a really big thing. I mean, this is everything. To do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with him. The message here isn't that we've made it too complicated, but that we're not even giving enough too often. God wants every part of our lives to be oriented towards him. In everything we do, as we walk with God throughout our lives, we need to act with justice and mercy. When we see wrongdoing, we are called to be that prophetic voice that speaks God's truth. And when we see someone hurting or in need of compassion, we are called to be the person that brings mercy and peace and comfort into their lives. Now I have to admit, I, I'm, I'm pretty big on the justice thing. I do a lot with outreach and community development here at Harbor Church, and I, I was kind of getting ready to, to hit you guys over the head with justice today, but God made me shift directions. And the thing that really stuck out to me this week was this idea of walking with God. What does it mean to walk with God? I have to admit, when I read the Bible about, read in the Bible about Adam and Eve walking with God in the Garden of Eden, or the disciples literally walking with Jesus down the road, I get a little jealous. How cool would it be to get to literally take a walk with God, like I would walk with my dog or something. But we're called to walk with God every single day, maybe not physically, but in our lives we're called to walk with God. And walking with God means going God's direction towards God's destination at God's pace. I'll say that again. Walking with God means going God's direction towards God's destination at his pace. That means sometimes we might need to turn left when we thought we were going to go right. Sometimes we, need, we might need to stop and take in the scenery when we really just want to run ahead and get to the next place. But we need to walk with God where he leads us. The other day, Libby and I were sitting in my office, and um, it turns out that Libby is a runner. And I, I like to run for exercise, but I wouldn't call myself a runner per se. But we were talking about running groups in Seattle. And, what, what options there are for her to join in the summer, or maybe start one, and those kinds of things. And eventually we got to kind of the pros and cons of running with a group. And I told Libby, I like to run by myself, and I like to run with a group because you can't really get lost, but I don't like running with one other person. And as I was saying this, I was picturing this time when I tried to go for a run with one of my college roommates. And um, I'm not a particularly fast runner, but I can go for a while. So when we were getting ready to run, I was, I was looking for like a 45 minute to an hour run. My friend, on the other hand, is really athletic and can go really fast, but she was maybe in it for 15 minutes because she would she'd go so fast and kind of tire herself out that quickly. 
So we tried to run together one day, and we got so frustrated with each other because there would be times when I wanted to go this direction and keep going, and she just wanted to turn around and go home. Or she would get mad at me because I was going too slow and it was uncomfortable, and then I'd get mad at her because I couldn't keep up. And eventually, we weren't running together anymore. We just kind of happened to be running at the same time. You know, we, weren't, we weren't in it together. But walking with God can't be like that. We're not called to just walk with God at the same time. We're called to walk with him. We need to go where he goes, when he wants us to go there, at the pace that he's already going. We don't get to fight with him about which turns we take. We need to just follow him and walk with him where he leads us. And that takes a lot of trust. That's not an easy thing to do. But you see, like Micah and like Israel, we have lots of reasons to trust in God. We can make a list of reasons for the hope that we have. We can look back on the ways that God has been faithful in the past and know that he'll be faithful again in the future. And so we can trust him and take those next steps and walk with him every day. So this week, as you go into your work, or into your relationships, or your family, or your school. Remember to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Remember all those ways that God has been faithful in the past to us as Harbor Church, and to each of us as individuals, and know that you can trust him as we move forward to whatever God has next.